Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's our second event of the Agile Expertise Product Week. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of Agile Expertise before, um, Meetup page has been going for quite a while. We're doing about an event a week at the moment. And uh, basically I had the idea to really um, going to the into the meetups in, into the product space in terms of meetups. So um, excited to see you all here. Lots of new faces, uh, which is excellent. Um, just some housekeeping before we get going and before I hand over to Stuart. Uh, we will do a Q and A at the end. I think it probably works best if we leave the questions until the end rather than interrupting Stuart um, during it. So if you do have any questions, then just pop them into the into the main group chat. If you could just icon the question with a Q before you ask the question, then um, I'll go through them later and um, you can sort of. Um, ask a question yourself uh, or I'm happy to just read them out myself depending on what you want to do. Um, so yeah, that's the best way of doing that. As always, many thanks to Agile World, um, to Tal and Giles who have been able to make it today um, for sort of helping um, me and expertise recruit and organize the events. Um, yeah, that's all from me really. Without further ado, very excited to hand over to Stuart who asks who wants to be a product manager? Uh, I will now hand over to you Stuart. Can you share your screen yourself or do I need to make you? I'm currently disabled. Okay, cool, that's fine. I will make you in control. Okay, you should, you should be able to do that now. Cool. Alrighty, uh, well, thanks for coming along everyone. Um, decent number of people. I'm really um, quite flattered by that. Um, and tonight, really, I just wanted to pose the question, uh, who wants to be a product manager? Um, by way of introduction, uh, I'm Stuart. Um, I'm currently working with these guys at Zariot, um, although I've actually got my own company uh, called Tech Photonics, which is where all the branding is, is everywhere around me. Um, I'm working, uh, like I say, with this company, Zariot, who are an IoT SIM card startup. Um, they've also um, got a parent company called Sedisys, and I'm doing some work with them as well. Um, my role is Chief Evangelist uh, and Head of Product at Zariot. Uh, my background is mainly in mobile telecommunications, messaging, IoT, uh, and also in product management. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, for the people out there, who st ever started their career thinking that they wanted to work in product management? I'm not sure anyone really ever does. I actually saw this tweet this morning, um, and I pulled it in as a last minute addition, um, but I thought this summed up product management really very, very nicely. You know, the point where uh, the engineers have got a problem with a power bank um, that's kicking out too much heat and they don't know what to do with it. So the product manager um, obviously has the task of saying, oh, that's great. Uh, we can turn that into a feature. Um, and I think that, that, that sums up uh, things quite nicely. But, you know, who wants to be a product manager? Um, certainly not me. Um, I started my life uh, wanting to uh, work in music. Um, I was a big music fan. Uh, I always wanted to be a record producer. It's obviously gone really badly wrong for me. Um, because uh, one of the first decisions I made was I wanted to go to university. Um, and back then, uh, the university options for someone who wanted to be a record producer were extremely limited. There was effectively nothing. Um, it's all changed now. Um, there are plenty of options, uh, music technology. Um, it's about 30 or so courses in the UK that anyone can go to. Um, and I think it's just kind of indicative of the fact that um, the world is opening up. There are more options for people these days, but certainly when I started, uh, product management wasn't um, on the list any, any more than um, being the option of becoming a record producer. Um, just as a brief aside, um, the graphic I pulled in on the left-hand side, I love the fact that it says noting, not nothing. Um, that really kind of tickles me, um, but obviously pointing out, making a note of the fact that my collection list is empty too. Um, although it does appear that there is an option out there now for uh, product design and management. Um, so, you know, kudos to Aston University for, um, for offering that, but this is the only option that I could find. And I do kind of wonder if um, you know, product management was more recognized as a discipline, um, that there would be more courses out there, uh, and maybe you know, some people would uh, even consider it as a, as a starting point. Anyway, as I said, there were no options for me when I started. So um, I actually went off um, and studied physics, um, although I couldn't quite let go of my dreams. So I actually did a joint degree in physics and music. Um, it's quite an unusual combination. Um, it was an incredibly disjointed degree, um, I did lots of hardcore physics and I did lots of, well, actually not very much music at all. Um, and um, that kind of brings me on to my first rule uh, of product management. Um, life is never perfect. Uh, so you really do have to work with what you have. 
And I think that, you know, really applies in the world of work and the world of product management as well, right? You'll never have enough time, enough money or enough resources, uh, but you have to deliver anyway. And I think the art of product management, one of the great arts is really kind of figuring out, figuring your way through that, uh, through that conundrum of never having everything that you need. So, um, having finished my degree, um, I almost achieved my dream. Um, I managed to get onto a, a BBC Radio Engineering graduate scheme. Uh, I went to work in, in radio. Um, it was a really great course. I mean, it, it took on people from all kinds of disciplines, people with history degrees, medical degrees, music degrees, history degrees, English, all kinds of things. Um, what it gave me, I think, was a completely thorough grounding in the ideas of engineering. So, um, you know, stuff that um, I still use today um, in terms of, you know, fault finding, how can we get stuff fixed? Um, you know, we did some elementary work in programming and things of that nature. Um, having been through my training and ended up in, in, in my final job, um, I kind of found out that really it was the wrong destination for me. Um, it was uh, very much a hardcore engineering job. We were expected to take machines apart and solder them and fix them. And that's literally not what um, that's not my background at all that's not really my mindset I'm not really a very practical person uh, neither minded or, or handed I guess um, but you know with that rule of life being never perfect and working with what you have um, I was lucky enough to be selected to to work on a big uh, project then so back when I joined BBC Radio which was about 100 million years ago um, radio programs were actually made on quarter inch tape machines um, and uh, they decided to run a, a feasibility project to see if it was possible to actually make uh, radio programs on computers. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of unthinkable now, but back then, uh, this was a big sort of feasibility study. Um, and I worked on this big, um, big project. Um, we had, a, you know, ability to build a team. Um, we had a specific objective of taking a number of shows and seeing if we could convert them over to working on digital. Um, and I think it kind of opens up one of the big differences really between projects and products is the fact that projects tend to be defined for you. Whereas um, when you're managing a product, you have more of an ability to think about what you want to do and, and, and build it the way that you want it to be. Having worked in broadcast for around sort of seven years, um, it was time for a change. Um, and I moved off uh, to working into telecoms. Um, I found an awful lot of similarities between the industries, not least that everything came in these big 19 inch racks. Um, and that kind of brings me on to rule two, I guess. Um, you know, I think skills are entirely transferable between industries, between disciplines. I think an, an effective product manager working in telecommunications can move into fintech or, you know, from um, building software apps can move into desktop. Um, very proud of my metaphor that not every analogy is like a chocolate teapot um but um i'm also kind of forced to explain that because not least my daughter said to me what on earth are you talking about what is a chocolate teapot obviously a chocolate teapot is a teapot made of chocolate that is obviously not fit for purpose so you know i think everything that we learn on our way through is entirely transferable and it's really important to think about my my brain definitely works in the way of metaphors and analogies and that's how i use that, that's how i'm able to talk to finance people talk to developers talk to marketing people talk to sales people talk to all the different disciplines that you need to interact with as a product manager in order to understand their point of view take their feedback you know, build the product in the way it needs to be um, put together so um moving into telecoms um i worked in project management um that was okay for a while. Um, certainly had a, you know, a certain amount of fulfillment. Um, but I always kind of wanted to get into sales. Um, I didn't quite make it into sales, but I certainly made it uh, moving into sort of a team management uh, position where I was managing a, a bunch of guys. Um, and eventually moved on into do some work in business development, also in sales engineering, until eventually I reached the product promised land uh, and I was appointed as a product manager. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't quite set up to be the kind of product manager that I really wanted to be. Um, it wasn't a job that I asked for. It was a job I was moved into. Um, it was a regional product management role. So my role was to look after the product from the European Middle East perspective, um, for North American based company. Um, 
I was responsible for plenty of kind of customer side interaction, but didn't really have any kind of ability to influence uh, the development of the product, the strategy, where it was going or anything of that nature. And that kind of brings me on to my rule three. Um, I think, you know, managing a product isn't always what I call product management. Um, it's not necessarily mean to say that it's not an essential role and it has to be done, but I think, you know, truly product management with, with the capital P and the capital M requires the ability to influence, like I say, drive the direction, respond to customer demand and, and build a thing. One of the guys I, I worked with um, always talks about being a product manager as being like a pizza shop owner. Um, and I think I kind of subscribe to that. It, it is an entrepreneurial role. Um, you think about your, you know, the guy who owns the, the small corner pizza shop, he has to buy in his ingredients, he has to decide what his menu is, he has to ensure that the process of crafting the pizzas is put together, he has to ensure the delivery or the table seating works properly, um, and he has to react to, you know, which pizzas are, buy, are selling, which ones aren't selling, you know, refresh the menu, keep things fresh. And I think, again, this is kind of an analogy that I carry with me and I think about uh, in my day-to-day -day role of just keeping things simple and thinking about my job as a product manager um, and you know what I can do to keep things fresh and that's also part of it right um, products aren't always in the build mode um, you know in my ideal world um, I'm always in startup mode I'm always thinking of new ideas and bringing new things to market but you know some products are in that innovation stage. Some of them are in steady state. You know, they don't really need to go anywhere. They just need to be looked after. Maybe a bit of bug fixing, but you know, just kind of sitting there in steady state. And you know, there's also a role for people to look after existing products with the existing customer base and, and take it to end of life. But um, for me, um, working in that steady state is not kind of where I wanted to be. Um, for me, that steady state felt like stagnation. Um, so it's time to move on again. Um, and I took another big step back into business development. Now, that last step into business development, um, I actually moved to a massive global corporate um, international company. Um, and I think they did a really, really almost textbook example of where product management can be conducted really badly wrongly. So, um, uh, I put this picture up because it really kind of felt like that on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, I think, for the product managers in the team. You know, everybody was doing their best to ensure that um, products were brought to market correctly and properly, but it was just seemed very, very confrontational. You know, you had to work with legal, you had to work with compliance, you had to work with finance, you had to work with support, you had to work with development. And I think one of the things that's really key there is this massive global uh, multinational corporation no one ever really thought of working with sales and definitely not with the customer um there was a, had a whole uh, you know six gate uh, product management product delivery process um it typically took around two years for a product to be brought to market uh, and by the time it was brought to market it wasn't what the customer ever wanted um and certainly what's not what sales was looking for um what's quite interesting actually is is, is the company kind of realized that so i'm i'm working in my business development role uh, and the company did kind of recognize they had problems with bringing new products to market. So what they did is they actually launched a competition. And that competition was, um, you know, can you um, pitch an idea for a product? Um, we'll run it as a competition across the entire company. Um, if you're successful in your pitch, um, you can come out of your role and we'll set you up as a kind of a pseudo startup and, and let you build that up as a, as a product, as almost like a separate little business. Now, um, Company-wide competition. Um, uh, I've got the tagline in front of me. It says, you know, can you suggest a product in line with core values that will generate $250 million in three years? Now, if I could think of a product that would generate $250 million in three years, I'd probably go and do it for myself rather than going and doing it for a large company. But um, a surefire way of winning that competition is to sit down in front of them with a straight face and tell them you're going to make $300 million in three years. Uh, because that's what we wanted to hear. Um, the team that I joined won the competition. So now here I am as a, a corporate entrepreneur. Um, and you know what? It felt kind of the same. Um, still the same issues of working with a large company. Um, 
the product team that I joined um, was working on a, a mobile product. Um, and the idea that we pitched and won with was to improve the latency um, from a mobile device to cloud-based services. We had a customer who had problem accessing Salesforce with their sales, uh, sales team in China. Um, obviously, the great firewall of China was getting in the way. At that time, Salesforce didn't have any local hosting, so everything was being backhauled to the US. Um, and we pitched and won the competition on, on a product um, designed to improve mobile latency. Um, as it turns out, and it's pretty obvious now with hindsight, of course, uh, mobile latency is a very difficult thing to sell. Um, it's quite intangible. Uh, you're very dependent on the local networks as well. So we pretty quickly pivoted it uh, to become a mobile security product. Um, arguably, it's a bit of a me too product. Um, I think they're still trying to run with this product. Um, still don't really have any market fit. Um, it doesn't scale at all well. Um, so being an entrepreneurial product manager and, and facing this kind of um, conflict, not only within the company, but also within the, the team I was working in, um, I actually pitched a whole new product, uh, spun myself out um, and got uh, the opportunity of running my own product. So the second idea. Second idea um, was offering um, IoT SIM cards um, online and self-serve. Uh, with a key market uh, pitched towards developers rather than necessarily global corporates. This was different for the company, not because it was different technology, um, but because it was uh, a different go to market. Um, different go to market versus, you know, sales guys being out there. We were online, 24 by 7, launched globally, available for anyone to come and buy. Um, focused towards developers, very heavy API um, focus, um, and it's designed to be a very, very low overhead, high margin type business. Um, still, I think a very, very strong proposition. Still, I think very, very relevant to this global corporation. And still, I think they don't get it. So, um, I think it's quite interesting to go through an exercise of, you know, how the company kind of got it so right, um, setting up this competition and uh, letting people fly, giving them a little bit of money and, and letting them go, uh, but at the same time getting it so wrong. So, you know, three key aspects, um, which I mentioned already, uh, time, um, they wanted huge customer adoption really, really quickly um, without really giving us time to build the products. Now, I was kind of lucky because I was able to partner with an existing provider in the field outside of the company, a competing product, in fact, um, but I got some speed and agility to work with those guys. Um, but even I was struggling uh, in order to hit the, the customer milestones they wanted. You know, they wanted me to increase the number of customers I had tenfold quarter by quarter. Simply not possible to do that quickly. Um, in terms of team, I had no team. Um, it was only me. Um, and I don't think um, most startups are successful with just one person working on their own. Teams are really, really important. Um, I was able to bring in uh, a couple of guys uh, on a freelance basis who I worked very closely with, very, very helpful and made a massive difference. But I think it would have been different if I'd had a, a fully functional internal team as well. If only to do what the Americans call blocking and tackling with some of the internal obstacles. And then money, um, of course, was a major, major uh, problem. Um, my boss had a huge hang up over budget. He would never tell me what my budget was on a quarterly basis. He had this mindset, if he told me what my budget was, I'd just go and spend it all. Um, I always contended if I didn't want what my budget was, I wouldn't be able to plan. So um, with all that in mind, um, it was kind of tricky. Um, it, Nothing's ever perfect, you know, we know that from rule one, but uh, it was certainly uh, some challenges working as in this golden, wonderful land as, as a cor corporate entrepreneur. Another way the company got it wrong um, was the management had all read the Lean Startup. And all they were interested in was um, strict compliance to the Lean Startup model. Um, you know, in, in their heads, um, I had to think as an entrepreneur, act as an entrepreneur, I was an entrepreneur. And they had no visibility of any of the corporate um, baggage, that, they, that I, the chains that were tying me down. So all they were interested in was, was me working on, on the Lean Startup principles. And yet, you know, as I've already talked about, um, perhaps arrogantly, I kind of feel that, you know, having been through product manage, project management, you know, team management, um, a lot of time in sales and also sales engineering, um, I've actually got quite a few um, skills of my own and, and, you know, experiences of my own um, rather than just working directly from the book. So there was this kind of natural conflict between the book and my personal experience. And I think my take out from that is there's always going to be a conflict between the methodology and the real world. Um, and the true path is kind of somewhere down the middle. Um, I made a note for myself here, methodologies are not orthodox religions. So, you know, take what you need from them. 
um, and use them for you rather than letting them dictate what you do. Similar basis, you know, lean startup and other methodologies always tell you to be wholly customer driven. And yet, you know, I still think there's a role for a product manager to kind of lead the market. There is this apocryphal story that uh, people talk about with Henry Ford that, um, you know, he said, if I asked my customers, they would just tell me they wanted faster horses. Um, I think that's now been debunked as a, as a genuine quote. But nevertheless, um, I think it's true that, um, you know, a proper product manager um, is aware of his customers, is aware of his market, aware of his product and, and kind of provides some direction and drives forward, pushing forward the technical envelope of what can be achieved. Final observation around this sort of period of my life is, is, is to do with teamwork. Um, and I put up a cycling team there. And Astana is not my favorite team, but it's the best picture I could find. But um, for those people who are aficionados of professional cycling, it's actually a really interesting discipline because only one guy is going to win this three-week Grand Tour race. Um, and there's always a team of nine people there to help. Um, you know, oftentimes there's members of the team who are perfectly capable of doing the same job, but it's not their role. So, um, you know, everyone works together. Uh, they play to individual strengths. You have, you know, people like sprinters and their role is literally to sit, be protected for a whole day and just pop up in the last 60 or 70 meters of a, of a, of a 200 kilometer race stage. Um, you've got the overall leader who has to be supported all the way through. Um, not everyone has, in the team has to be a star, um, but um, everyone is certainly a contributor to the success of the project. And I think that's, that, that's, a, that's a key take out as well. So, you know, um, concluding that part of my life working for this big 900 pound gorilla organization, um, for various reasons, I was able to fold my project uh, back into the company, uh, exit out of that, um, and move on and go and do something else. Um, same thing again, but completely different. Um, left a big 900 pound gorilla corporation and joined a, a small, young, puppy type startup. Um, it's a really exciting opportunity for me to join a smaller, much more agile team. Um, certainly with the ability of growing into something that's pretty scary when it gets to a, a certain age. And rule five, I mean, for me, it's, it's more of a rule for life, I think, than product management is no way you belong. Um, Puppies shouldn't live with gorillas, and, and I certainly didn't belong, belong in the big corporate environment. I'm certainly much sorted out, uh, much better off uh, in a small entrepreneurial type um, arrangement. Um, where, you know, for my mind right now, we're getting it right. So, um, you know, we're bootstrapping a business, um, but the, um, the funders of the company have given it time to grow. Um, you know, the intention was to launch a Mobile World Congress in March this year. That was obviously cancelled because of COVID. So that was all put on hold. Um, there's a lot of um, pent up demand, we think, for, for the services, but no one's really buying at the moment. But, you know, we've been given time to breathe and time to grow and time to think about what we want to build this thing into. Um, I've joined a fantastic team. Uh, great bunch of guys. Um, as I said, my role is Chief Evangelist and Head of Product. Um, I've actually got a split role with the CTO, so he looks after the development side, he's incredibly technical, very, very good at what he does. I look after more of the customer side, where I'm happy, working on the commercial side. Um, and finally, funds, you know, we don't have limitless cash, in fact, quite the opposite, got far less money than I've ever had previously. But um, what we've got is a management structure that is willing to listen, um, you know, willing to fund deals, uh, if that's what it takes to win them, um, and any worthwhile ideas that we have for investment and certainly invested in so that's where i am now um but being who i am i've got some ideas um for some other things i want to do i'm also running a little project in parallel looking at the scourge that is uh, phishing attacks that we'll receive over sms messaging every day um if anyone sees me on linkedin i, I post a daily post um of a phishing message that i've seen from somewhere around the world naming and shaming the mobile operators who are using their, letting their SIM cards being abused to send out this free messaging um, and just kind of providing advice on what can be done. And I've actually been able to uh, bootstrap a product for the main company that does that. So I'm kind of running two product management roles in parallel. And I've got my own ideas for a couple of other projects I'd like to bring to market at some stage in the future as well. Certainly plenty to do. So I'm um, just going to recap those rules very quickly before I wrap up. Um, life is never perfect. Work with what you have. You're never going to have enough time or money. Um, the skills you have are entirely transferable. You know, don't underestimate them. Um, not every analogy is a chocolate teapot. Um, managing a product is not always what I call product management. That doesn't necessarily mean to say it's not worthwhile. It doesn't necessarily mean to say it adds a lot of value. 
Um, but for me, there is only one type of product, true product management, and that's that entrepreneurial building a new thing, innovating um, and building, bringing something to market. Products themselves have categories um, and they kind of sit into those innovate, steady state or terminate. Very proud to be able to get a rhyming uh, triplet on that. Uh, and finally, you know, know where you belong um, because puppies, after all, shouldn't live with gorillas. Um, I thought it was always good to put up a list of credits because I've obviously used uh, an awful lot of photos in this deck. Uh, so there's a bunch of credits. And that's how to get hold of me. If you want to learn some more, um, find out some bits and pieces about what I'm up to. Um, understand the products or you know love to hear your thoughts on where you're up to in your journey in product management cool great stuff Stuart really really enjoyed that uh, I think it was uh, yeah some really, some really good learnings in there and uh, good analogies as, <laughs> as well I really like that the good little pictures um, I think should we just dive straight into the questions I think we've got a couple already I, I imagine people will be having a little little thing about what they want to ask themselves. Um, I think Marcos um, has one. Do you want to ask yourself, Marcos? Or do you mean to read it out? I'm going to take that. I'll read it out. <laughs> Is your answer, Ben? Right <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Stuart, when you tried the lean startup cycle, was yep. there a point uh, where you met more resistance than others, e.g. funding the hypotheses to develop the MVP? If yes, did you manage to push back on it? Does that make sense? That's a really interesting question. I mean... <sighs> And I had, a, I had a significant, again, this is part of uh, sort of large corporate stuff, but I had a significant management change halfway through my journey as well. So I started off with a management team who were based in Silicon Valley, um, you know, very much get some customers, you know, get people, don't worry about the money, the money will come. Um, and it kind of flipped to more of a conservative, where's your revenue, how are we going to fund this, is your business viable type mentality halfway through. So um, a number of, I had a number of challenges working with Lean Startup and, and one of them, one of the major ones, I'm hoping I'm going to answer this question Marcos for you, but um, one of the major challenges I had was um, everyone was always encouraging me to find a niche for my product. Uh, and yet my product was IoT SIM cards for developers. And I really didn't care what the developers were going to use them for. You know, I didn't care if they were going to go into trucks. I didn't care if they were going to go into air, se air quality sensors. I didn't care if they were going to go into healthcare devices. You know, that's not the point of what I was trying to achieve. What I was trying to demonstrate was um, a different go-to-market, an ability to reach the long tail, um, and a way of the company to offer its products out on the market in a completely different way. Um, I'm not entirely sure still the, the company entirely got that. Um, I thought it was kind of ironic that, um, you know, we had an API team who delivered a bunch of APIs purely for, to enable customers to interface to the customer care system. Um, and there was me on my own who brought uh, to market a completely fully, you know, functional self-serve e-commerce store um, that uh, anyone could use from all over the world. So, um, you know, there was resistance, um, massive trade-off between, um, you know, where are your customers? Is this a viable business versus, you know, just the room to play? Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, when you, when you read Lean Startup and you read the stories in there, uh, it all kind of starts off from, you know, we've got a bunch of customers, five or six customers who are, who we're developing with and developing for. Um, I don't think we ever really kind of got to that stage, uh, to enable us to do that. Cool. Well, that's good. I think that, that answers the question. Um, nice one. I also had a question. Um, it was just uh, basically if you could sort of go back again um, and, you know, you had the choice of going into big corporate or into startup, which, which would you choose and, and why? Um, it's funny. I mean, obviously I started my life in a massive corporate. Uh, BBC at that time is a huge organisation. Um, I always feel, and, and I've been, you know, I've been, uh, I've been in small companies and I've been in large companies. I mean, small, you know, 200 odd people, um, relatively small for me. Um, now we're in a group of, you know, five, eight of us uh, working together, but, you know, paired with a sister company. I belong in, in a smaller company. Uh, that's kind of where I belong. Um, I need the ability to 
do crazy things like when the ceo comes to me and says i'm sick and tired of receiving all these phishing messages on my phone i can say right i know how to fix that let's build a product um we've kind of almost got sold that product and we haven't even built it yet um so you know that shows um just the ability to be able to do stuff like that is, is really exciting for me so I, I need that agility um there are definitely comforts of being in a big company um i certainly miss my pension contributions uh, amongst other things um and like all things you never really know how good it is till you haven't got it anymore you know the ability of actually having a bunch of funding for a quarter and saying go out and spend how much money it was um and being able to build a team and build a thing was, was just a fabulous experience but ultimately you know i'm much happier in a smaller company for sure yeah, cool. Yeah, I thought, thought that'd be answered. I think that kind of led on from probably what you said about, um, you know, the, the manager you had where, you know, it was a lot of sort of time constraints and um, the lack of team and, uh, you know, the money situation. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I guess that was sort of, that was part of a, a follow up question from me is sort of, um, yeah, I guess if you've got that type of situation with a manager and you, you they're not telling you what the budget is, for example, or <laughs> there is a lack of budget, you know, is there, what was your advice around that? Is it just a, you know, there's not much you can do or is it, you know, or is there a guess out? How would you deal with that situation? I mean, that was one of those crazy big company uh, situations where if no one's going to tell you what your budget is, just assume it's the same as last quarter and off you go. Yeah. Make the, <laughs> make, make the commitments. Um, yeah. Obviously being a large company, um, I was able to actually sign the orders. Oh, I, I was able to go to people who had signing authority because everything was done through the UK and my boss wasn't based in the UK. So I could basically just put a DocuSign in front of any VP and they would just sign it by matter of course or get their PA to do it for them and issue out orders for immense amounts of money without anyone even noticing. And, and today, uh, I still don't think they, they understand that loophole is in place. But that's large <laughs> corporate for you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um good stuff I, I don't think there's any more questions ken do you have anything to ask i don't know or, or you might be holding back uh no i mean just to say very interesting i certainly my, my career has been similar in many respects in terms of telco and um working for large corporates contracting actually for the last 18 years yeah. uh with the likes of vodafone no two and everything so I've, so i've seen that big company stuff but also had um, well, two goes at my own startup, which obviously Wizwall at the top of the school was, was one of them, but, which is, you know, always have had the best fun, learned the most, yep. um, but, but always find the challenge, certainly I found the challenge, you know, raised angel investment and government funding for the last one, but still you run out of money and you spend all your time chasing around and that, that that's the frustration I think is, is, is to try and find that balance that, you know, Obviously, working for large corporates, you've got the money, but you, you've not got the um, the same level of autonomy. Yep. Um, and and when you're a, like it is, you know, Wizball is just me with a team of offshore developers in India. It's great. It's fantastic. You can do whatever you want. But ultimately, if you're bootstrapping, then there's a limit to that. Um, I think it's then, really frustrating because you can see how the corporates could do it right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm reading a, a, a management book at the moment, uh, In Search of Excellence. Um, you know, it was written in 1980. Um, and it's, it's, you know, for the Americans about how can we stop being completely overtaken by the, the, the Japanese who are getting everything right right now. And even yeah. in there, they're talking about, you know, skunk work teams, give them freedom, let them go, do their thing, challenge the status quo, don't worry about duplication, all of these things, all of these lessons that, you know, 40 years later i i've seen this global corporate that i worked for not figured out yet and it's so frustrating yeah i think i think i mean you know my experience of um you know with with Wizball being a you know effectively ties in with the whole sort of covid people having to work remotely and, and the, you know the likes of you know mural and miro have, have they've done massively well out of that and Mural raised 120 million, 118 million of um, Series B recently. And there's little old me with sort of like bootstrapping something. And I think, how have I built, you know, that's it never ceases to amaze me how, you know, because of you offshoring, it's, it's, it's a lot cheaper, clearly. Yep. But, but still, you think, how have I done that? And if I had, you know, any sort of budget within a large corporate to do this, then 
what could I do? What could I achieve? You know, and uh, so it's it's, it's and kind the, of yeah. And the answer again is nothing because of all those guys uh, in yeah. clients who won't let you call it what you want to call it because somebody's called it something similar forty-seven yeah. years ago in Taiwan, and you know. Um, the list just goes on and on and on forever. Yeah, so. I, 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 th- I, for, for me, I think you know my my strategy is to is is to to build and you know more more than MVP and then get a large corporate interested and and get acquired. I think that's 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 you know because again you know like you say it would take them so much time to develop the same. Yeah, they could do it clearly, but but um, as that- we know, things take a long time in corporates. And that's why I've seen it done really well. One of my former startups built um, an online um, picture messaging store for Kodak. And um, we're working very closely with Kodak around the sort of, you know, when digital was really taking off. Um, they saw picture messaging. Well, I mean, the founder still reckons he invented the concept of picture messaging. Um, and they built a fantastic picture messaging product. Um, and, you know, they had this core technology, which is all about, about you know, image transcoding. And they just spun little projects off of it very very yeah. smart stuff um and yeah they, they just went very very deep with a number of very big customers mm. i think just the, the other thing i would say in terms of corporate versus um you know startups or companies is clearly as, as a startup as i have you know it's really easy to pivot because you just basically just go yeah i can see the opportunity or as a corporate you know when you've got like you know waterfall you know uh, PI type sort of some one of those is, is basically saying okay we well, said you're going to deliver this yeah and if you're not going to deliver this then you need to raise a change request for that and um, it's just it's just a lot more difficult to be truly agile and, and truly sort of um, I can hear my that's, former that's managers I can hear my former managers words ringing in my ears and saying so what you're saying is you're a failure okay yeah well and that's it you know and i i guess i i think that's true as well is that it, it's a lot more difficult to fail quickly in yeah. a corporate because you know and, and so you end up because that the it, it's still a very waterfall type thing so people are expecting in a year's time to deliver what what, what you said you were going to deliver and then if you didn't as you say you've you've kind of um you failed yeah yeah. So, yeah 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 absolutely nice one i think Ooh. i think i think ron's got a question as well he's on uh the train so i will uh put a background noise so i'll read out the question for him um, people still take trains in 2020 who knew? <laughs> yeah very very risky indeed um, <laughs> uh, so the question is i have a an it background uh, and network uh, sorry an it and networks background i've moved over time into a pm scrum master type role um, as some client product owners can be challenging. Uh, how, did you, how did you find that transition to becoming a product manager? Um, I think for me, it, it's almost came quite naturally because one of the problems I've always had, Ben, and I think you know, when we first met, I talked to you about this maybe. Um, when you look at my CV, you look at my resume, uh, it's a mess. You know, I've done so many different jobs, so many different roles, and um, the one role for me that is really, truly... Um, jack of all trades is that, is that product management role you know you've got to be able to talk to developers you've got to be able to talk to finance legal sales marketing i do a little bit of everything um and because i kind of bounced around a little bit um you know partly through my own choice partly because of inability of doing what i've actually employed to do um it just kind of gave me that background um in, in product management um I'm not even sure today if I would necessarily consider myself a product manager or more of a, a stunted entrepreneur. But um, you know, I think um, owning a product is a is is a great it's, it's a great role, I, and I think it's the best role for me um, in any organisation, really. Yeah, good good to hear. I think yeah, and that, that is the beauty of product management, isn't it? You know, you, you do you are able to kind of touch upon um, lots of different areas of the business, and yeah. uh, you know, you are wearing lots of with lots of uh, you know, hats which is yeah. which is great and i think people do love that um, but you didn't i mean you know anything you're doing now um if you know if you've come from software or you've come from engineering or you've come from finance or you've come from sales or you come from marketing doesn't really matter where you've come from all of that you'll be using in the future hmm. um and all of those transferable skills that i talked about um and the ability to you know understand the pain these guys are going through and you know whether it makes sense to build this as one 
big lump of code or you know segment it into different services or whatever it is um you need to be able to understand have those conversations and understand what's going on so yeah it's excellent. all good stuff yeah. yeah it is yeah it's very good um i don't think there are any other questions marcos did you have another question see you switch camera on no that's why <laughs> i just wondered if that was a prompt that you're interested in asking one um yeah, i think just a, a comment on um enterprise versus entrepreneur uh in a, a small business startup when you got, are in a big environment, everything's more difficult because there's one thing people forget. You were competing for politics. And uh, there are people with huge egos. They built their careers based on that. And here you come proposing an idea who is going to demolish that. They are not going to support you. They will support you in, in words, but they will undermine the effort. And, I'm saying undermine, some do actively undermine, some just covertly undermine the effort. Either way, the result is negative at the end. And it, it becomes that way. I've been, um, I've been and I, I, said, I said in the comments, I started on big corporation, then I went to uh, my own startup, and then I went back to corporation. It is that it, you have the pleasure when you run your own show to do everything, but you have all the responsibility too. You have to pay the bills and you know what you spend and you have all the obligations. Everything is on top. And then you doubt, am I doing the right thing? And, and so on and so on. There's no bad to blame, basically. When you are in a big corporation, there's always a finger pointing somewhere else. But it, that's the difficulty. And, and as they are big, um, they want to more than ever, although they say, oh, we are agile. They are not. They want to protect their investment first, no matter what. And the cost savings second. So they are like hand in hand. Creativity and innovation take a backseat because they're not safe. Failing, uh, we say agile, fail fast. So you move and you, you learn from it and you do something else. Um, failure is not, although they say, oh, yes, we have to fail fast, but you are a failure. Uh, it's what Stuart said. Yeah. So you're saying you're a failure, but the, it's frowned upon. So those are the trade-offs. I in seeing you guys talk, I love to attend the UK meetings because I can see the different cultures. I've been in work for different countries, and you can see this pattern repeats everywhere. Yeah. It's not unique from anywhere. So don't run away to another country thinking, oh, it's so much greener over there. No, it isn't. Same thing. I did, some, um, I did some management training in, uh, in the US. Um, one of my companies sent me away for a week of management training in Santa Clara. And uh, one of the sessions was like, right now we're going to do company politics. I was like, hang on a minute. What do you mean company politics? Company politics is because yeah, everyone in the UK says, oh, I want to work for a company with no politics. Uh, but the Americans kind of embrace it and say, you know, look, it's a fact of life. It's there. It's going to happen. What's important is learning to manage it. And, you know, I, I kind of sat there and went, uh, isn't politics bad? And the, the tutor was like, what? And just wrote it up on the board because he'd never heard that statement before. But uh, that was quite an opener for me, for sure. You put people in play, politics come. Because people come, I mean, you go back to our primitive days on the caves, the clans and the tribes and the groups and the families, and it's mine, 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 and, and you form and you call them cliques, you yep. call them groups, you call them associations. It's the same thing. It's human behavior. Uh, it can't be avoided. There is politics. You have a few altruistic people who want the good of everything and they will be stepped on and kicked out <laughs> very quickly <laughs> you know it's like it's your picture of the little puppy and the big gorilla yeah <laughs> you have this little puppy trying to face the big gorilla and gorilla just choke him up yeah. puppies shouldn't live with gorillas no no they get they get sat on yep <laughs> for sure Excellent. Cool. i think that's that's probably it any, any other comments roger florina Anything, anything to add? Uh, it doesn't have to be a question, it can be a comment. Uh, no worries if you don't have anything, but just want to give you the opportunity. Great, Great. enjoy the chat, thank you. Good to hear, yeah, no, yeah. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, um, I think that's really good. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. Um, I think everyone's, everyone's really enjoyed that, which is, uh, which is fantastic, that's the idea. Welcome. <laughs> um, quite a challenge to drag yourself down your uh, memory lane and uh, go back <laughs> over your life and look and see what you've been up to. So uh, quite enjoyed it, actually.
yeah it's, it's really interesting it's i think it's that's just a, it's a great topic it always to discuss you know that that kind of battle between startup and uh and corporate i think yeah people love it as you know spark debate obviously um it here but um yeah again many thanks uh thanks for coming on and obviously taking the time to uh to do all of that uh i guess just to round off um you know we've still got two more events this week uh for the product weeks so we've got an, the normal agile expertise event tomorrow which is uh it's dean um La lachana i think is his name um uh, he's done a couple of events with us before um really really good guy definitely worth uh, worth spotting there's a lot of agile um meetup talks and then on friday we're rounding off the week um with a guy called henry latham um who's actually a product management coach uh, having been a product manager himself he's he's um, works for startup where they basically kind of fast track product managers to heads of products so um, could spark some debate on that as well if you can actually fast track people um, <laughs> that would be my thoughts around that but um, yeah it'd be interesting to see what he says uh, but yeah other than that really nice to see everyone and uh, thanks thanks for attending um, yeah without further ado I guess you know that's uh, that, that's pretty much that anything to add from you Stuart anything to round no, off just, uh, thanks for the opportunity and thanks everyone for coming and, and engaging as well much appreciated cool good Great stuff yeah nice one well yeah, thanks, have a lovely Stuart. have a lovely evening everyone and uh, we'll hopefully look forward to seeing you in the next couple of meetups great stuff thanks Ben no worries yep. cheers all. thanks nice one cheers everyone bye bye have a good one <laughs>